June 1921, tenders were called for the first air service between Geraldton and Derby. Really was the man to take it on. There was no doubt about that. The successful tender came from him and uh, he worked out that it was going to cost him £25,000 per year to run the event. That's an enormous amount of money. It was 1,200 miles up, 1,200 miles back. He quoted four shillings a mile and 52 trips per year. Add all that up and you get to £25,000. So he covered all bases, submitted his tender and uh, was successful. The government decided that they would provide the landing grounds along the way, plus uh, emergency landing grounds. And so really had to cover virtually everything else. Prospectus was published in 1921. He had troubles arranging the finance. People in Perth indicated that they would like to invest money in the, the deal, but uh, the closer it got to the day, uh, the more they withdrew. And so he had some problems on his hands from a financial point of view. He was very lucky in that he had his uh, a loan guaranteed by H.V. McKay from um, his machinery business in uh, Victoria and um, really had arranged for a loan from the federal government uh, and the Commonwealth Bank and it had to be guaranteed and so McKay guaranteed it. But up until that time uh, the proposal was on shaky grounds. Really ordered six aircraft from Bristol and England um, early in the piece and he arranged for cash on delivery. So he really had to muster up the money uh, by the time the aircraft got to uh, Fremantle. And uh, he was very relieved when McKay came to the party. He had to select pilots and that involved him testing pilots over east. He got the assistance from the Royal Air Force and the Civil Aviation Board, and he chose uh, three pilots. Those three were uh, Kingswood Smith, Bob Fawcett, and Glenn Taplin, and they became part of the history of aviation in Western Australia. He already had Arthur Blake selected, who was living in Western Australia, and he also had Val Abbott, who was a West Australian, who he employed more from the point of view of being a lawyer, uh, although uh, Abbott was a pilot and had been trained by Brearley in Gosport during World War I. So once the aircraft arrived in Fremantle, he was able to pay the money, but he only had 10 days to set things up and get the show on the road. The date was the 5th of December, and so 10 days to get the aircraft from Fremantle Wharf up to Perth, assembled, rigged and test flown, and then the pilots who were employed were given time to familiarise themselves with the aircraft. He also had a contract to erect buildings at the aerodromes en route, and this was part of the expense and part uh, of his organisation that took a lot of time. So you can see the man was under a lot of pressure. In that three months, he was shuffling cards, and in the last 10 days, he was keeping a lot of things all turning over in his mind. He got a report back that Geraldton Airport wasn't in very good shape, so he said to Arthur Blake up there to have a look, and he said it was dreadful. Don't even think about going there. So Arthur Blake went down the road to Gould's Field and negotiated with Mr. Gould and they use his field. That's currently where the Durham uh, Airport is. Really had already erected a hangar at the original site which had to be dismantled 
and brought us to glory mm-hmm. still. <clears throat> the root of the service paralleled or followed virtually the telegraphic link between Geraldton and Derby. Derby was aware of this, equipped each of his aircraft with a mobile telephone. Uh, pretty original stuff in those days. But on the 4th of December, the aircraft uh, got away from the Esplanade and flew to Geraldton with an overnight and took off on Australia's first official uh, airmail service. As I said, the aircraft were um, equipped with a field telephone and they also carried one of these. That is a Slater's uh, telegraphic code and in there there are 6,000 words each with a number and instead of sending words you could send a series of numbers and sort of uh, make your work somewhat secret. So the service got underway on the Monday <coughs> after the departure from Perth, 5th of December which was written into the contract and uh, there's a photo of the aircraft on the Esplanade with their engines underway, ready to go. The other photo on the other side uh, contains all those involved in the preparation for the event. Aircraft number one carried Norman Brealey, MP Durack. We talked about MP Durack some time back, a few months ago, talking about his granddaughter, Mary Durack, who married Horry Miller. The tall bloke is Bob Fawcett. Next to him is Norman Brealey, and the one nearest me is Len Taplin. They were the people on board the second aircraft. Trustrail was an engineer, and on the third aircraft was Bob Fawcett, and Edward Broad, who was another engineer cup mechanic. They departed Geraldton in loose formation and uh, set about the first leg of Australia's first air service. After covering about 80 miles, Chapman's aircraft had a rough running engine, so he landed in a paddock. And the person that witnessed this or saw this first was, but it was Fawcett, who flew low overhead, stalled the aircraft and crashed and both he and his passenger were killed. So that's the photo of Taplin's aircraft on the ground. There's a very minor amount of damage to the front of it where it ran into the trees. Interestingly, uh, it compares the modes of transport of the day. Uh, Camels were big in the business of transport. Cars and trucks were a rarity. I wonder whether those camels were from the party of surveyors. A bloke called Fred Johnson had done a survey of the airfields and was on his way back to Perth when he just happened to stop at Murchison House Station and uh, the rigmarole was going on after the, the crash of the aircraft and he eventually became the Commonwealth Surveyor General but what actually happened also was that he said to Brealey um, don't even think of flying north of here the landing grounds are dreadful and so the crash took place and Brealey landed in a paddock and he was approached by some Aborigines who told him the bad news. He didn't realise what had happened. And so he borrowed a horse for himself and for MP Durack and they rode back to the homestead where they saw the wreck. That photo was actually taken by MP Durack who happened to have a camera with him on the day. Two people were buried uh, the following day and it was a very 
disappointing to say the least event for Brearley, who had worked so hard to get the show on the road, and now it looked as if it was going to be a disaster. MP Durack had a serious talk to Brearley and said, no, what you've got to do is carry on. And so that's what he did. Brearley blamed the uh, federal government for lack of preparation of landing fields. He claimed that there should have been an emergency landing ground, which the aircraft with the rough running engine could have made, but it didn't, and uh, it crashed, resulting in that uh, tragic end. So there we are, MP Durack convinced him. Colonel Brinsmead, who was in charge of civil aviation in Australia at the time, had decided that he was going to come across to Western Australia and be part of the event. What in fact was, he had the same type of aircraft that Brearley was using. He got to South Australia and lost five days because of uh, bad weather. He then carried on and lost a day in Meriden because of a rough running engine and then eventually got to Perth. He was three days behind Brearley and therefore missed the event. He heard about the accident and decided that he would fly up the route, catch up with Brearley and have a talk to him, and he would also drop into Murchison House where the accident took place and pay his respects. What in fact happened was that he was seen uh, transiting the route towards Murchison House, but he didn't arrive. And so a few questions were asked. Where has he got to? The next thing, the telegraph link between Geraldton and Carnarvon ceased to work. What had actually happened was that Brinsmead had force landed near the telegraphic link and he didn't carry a field telephone with him and the only thing he could do was to cut the wire. So he did and this alerted people in the telegraphic offices that it was a problem. They sent out a ground party to find out what the problem was, and they found um, our friend on the ground. Um, and between them all, they had sufficient equipment to mend the aircraft and get it in the way. So the problem with the uh, airfields went on and on. And some say that Brinsmead's snipping of the telephone why was the first time that the telegraphic system had been used to announce an emergency in the aviation industry? Maybe yes, maybe no. That's a photograph of a field telephone. The ones that WA Airways had were smaller than that, about half the height, but about the same plan, form, or shape at the base. The aircraft, I believe, were equipped with a Slater's uh, telegraphic guide, which I showed you just a moment ago. That's it there. Each of the aircraft had one of these, and I'm led to believe that this was one that was used by WA Airways. The telegraphic code book had a list of words, and uh, each word was in ascending alphabetic, alphabetical order and numbered, and so instead of sending words, you would send numbers. With a code book, could read your message. And so it was decided that uh, an encryption method might be used. Pilots were told to use the book if there was a, a message that uh, they had to get through, and they were also told to encrypt the message. Not always was a message uh, encrypted uh, could be sent normally. But the problem was there were sticky beaks and the transmissions went to many, many people, were available to many, many people. And so the encryption system uh, came into being. And uh, that's an image of the page. That's an enlargement of one of the pages. And if you're interested in that word, the word dial, then you would look up that number. 
if you just happen to be interested in the word digit, then you would look up that number. And you could transfer that by telegraphic means to the recipient. However, let's just look at how the encryption might work. Imagine that the news that I, as a manager in Perth for WA Airways, want to send to someone in a remote area for one of the uh, country centres, I want to send a message to Carnarvon and messages, new machine, ordered. And so I take out the Slater's book and look up numbers, numbers, numbers. So if I send that to you in the Carnarvon office, gossips, sticky beaks, will understand what I'm talking about. And so I may have sent you a letter saying that for the week starting the 22nd of March this year, I will add a certain number to all of my transmissions. And so instead of sending those numbers to you in Carnarvon, I add 253 to each of them. You know this. And I know that, and you get these numbers sent to you. But when you look them up, you don't look them up as per that. You do the reverse and find out what the message is. The sticky beak looks up that number that I've transmitted and finds that word and that one and so it's absolutely meaningless and so not only in the airline business in other businesses where people were using the telegraphic code um, code book they uh, use this encryption method there are a number of things you could do of course you could uh, add or subtract a value and you could transpose numbers. And so if the word you were looking at was 1,025, you would advise the recipient by some other means, a letter or so, that instead of 1,025, you will read 1,052 until I tell you what the change of code is. So this was used for sensitive information by lots of people and certainly by Brearley and West Australian Airways. However, another system was the unofficial code in West Australian Airways that Brearley knew nothing about. He was maybe the only person in the company that didn't know anything about this code. It was the green paint. If you go back in history and look at the aircraft, they were in fact painted green. And there's a fair bit of green paint moved up and down uh, the coast to various places. And so a message from someone in the office in Perth might read, expect green paint to arrive on Monday morning. Really was the only one who didn't know what green paint meant. In fact, translation was, expect no <laughs> <laughs> and so <clears throat> that was uh, how the staff operated and that was what went on in those days so thank you very much